Um, I was asked to um, give a very short impulse to trigger some discussion. Now I realize that it's rather some kind of presentation, so I'll do my best. The title of my talk is not what, but who constructing subject positions in academic discourse. I want to deal with a very common problem in our daily life as social researchers, um, the question of subjectivity of interpretation. We all know that when we deal with empirical material, there are many ways to interpret, to understand whatever is out there. And to make a long story short, which you'll know of course from your work, we can distinguish maybe between two fundamental points of view. One is the anarchist kind of um, position. Um, the epistemological anarchist would say, everything is subjective, everybody, well, produces individual interpretations, and there's no way to really control this excessive meaning. The other point of view is the negationist point of view, and, and that's the point of view of those who think that empirical material has some kind of meaning that we can just read off the surface and understand. And there's, there's some procedures with which we can more or less objectively have access to this meaning. Um, of course, behind these um, two positions, there are certain uh, traditions of research which I do not uh, want to go into, but um, my point is, of course, that both of them are not really correct, but not, not totally false either. Um, the basic, the normal, the standard response to these challenges is to, to come to some kind of intersubjective interpretation, to control subjectivity by, for example, discussing interpretations in a collective interpretive workshop. Or the other um, solution, standard solution in the social sciences at least, is to have um, a coding strategy, to have various students in most cases um, coding complex and large uh, collections of texts and then try to um, um, be reliable with these codings. And um, what I want to call the question in this presentation is the underlying assumption that by collectively um, um, eliminating subjectivity or the grand variety of interpretations, we come to some kind of more social or uh, reliable um, interpretation. And which is the underlying assumption of both these standard um, solutions in, um, in the social sciences. Um, I rapidly want to present the discursive approach, which, um, which points out that whenever we deal with texts in a broad sense, that is mostly, of course, linguistic texts, but in, 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 in a general way with um, empirical material. Um, the point is that we always need to cooperate with these texts and that we construct subject positions. <coughs> so we cannot not associate whatever is said with certain people out there. And the question is how the readers do that. They want to know who speaks out there. And the question is how by reading these texts, they come to certain notion, ideas, knowledge of who's out there with whatever kind of ideas. And so um, the question is, is no longer that much to, to say what is really in the texts, but rather to ask how these texts are interpreted by certain experts in order to get a knowledge about who really speaks in these texts. And in a way, um, we will turn our attention away from, from the idea that there is some kind of meaning in the texts that we can um, discover, which is, for example, what, what content analysis uh, presupposes, nor do we think that this construction of meaning is totally arbitrary. So we are just somewhere in between. And I just want to give you a short example of how we can deal with this problem. Um, my specialty is the analysis of academic discourse. And, and in a way, um, academic discourse reminds us of the same problems. Um, we always need to interpret texts, of course, in our daily research. And so in a way, um, the experts in these collective interpretive workshops, coding teams, 
they deal with a problem that we have to deal with all the time. And we're commonly supposed to be the experts in interpretation of texts. We are the ones who really know how the real meaning of texts of empirical material looks like. So what I did in my uh, research project on um, academic discourse in the social sciences and humanities is to have various experts in, in, in these disciplines read short snippets of texts and then ask who comes to their mind. And here, for example, I have a, a short excerpt from Foucault. Uh, we just see here the first sentence. It was a little longer. We can't really have a look at this. Um, and then I asked philosophers, linguists, literary people, um, who were the people that were associated by them? The point being here, in, in an utterance like this, there's not only the author speaking, who is, of course, indicated at the end as the official legitimate author of, 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 of the work. But these, these utterances of these texts are fundamentally polyphonic. They not only refer to, to the author, but to many other people who are marked here, for example, by the markers of polyphony like nor and neither. With these markers, texts indicate those who are not the authors, but still speak in some way in the text. So in a way, these texts um, refer to a multitude of voices which the readers need to associate with certain positions of their discourse. And that's why it is interesting to have a look at how real readers read these texts, because they will ask, of course, and they will try to solve the problem, who are these others, the implicit others of these texts? And, and of course, the, the, the idea is that when we read such an utterance, there's a subject position or a slot going up, going, going um, uh, opening, where we need to, well, fill the opening slot with our um, background knowledge of, of this discourse. And the question these, these experts have to deal with is, who are the people saying man is the oldest or the most constant problem that has been posed for human knowledge? Um, this is just to remind you that these texts are fundamentally dialogical and, and only a very small number of these positions that are kind of alluded to in these texts are associated with certain names. So it's a practical task, task of the readers to really know who is the implicit other in, in these texts. And, and that's what I try to um, have my readers talk about. And I give you here a, um, the results of, of interviews with five different experts in the social sciences and humanities. And what you can see here, of course, that there are many different, very individual associations um, which are produced by my experts, but certain kind of re re recurring names. And the recurring names are, for example, Levi Strauss. Here you see. He basically, um, well, no, let me explain how to read this table. I had these um, different experts from philosophy and linguistics, and I asked them who Foucault was with or against when he wrote the text. So uh, plus means the names, the people in academic discourse he, he was an ally of, in a way, and, and the minus is the adversary, right? So, and then I listed all the names that were coming up in these interviews, and um, I discovered that there are certain names coming up only once, of course, I mean, that's a large majority. And then there are certain names which, which are repeatedly said, mostly very canonical names, like Saussure and Derrida. Um, and the interesting thing was that here, Saussure and Derrida are, in one case, cited as, um, well, an ally and, and an antagonist, and here, just the other way around, right? The, the linguist says, well, Derrida is an ally, and Saussure is, is, is an adversary. So, um, now, if we come back to our idea of interpretation being some kind of, well, intersubjective experience or intersubjective activity, this is evidence that, in a way, we produce different interpretations. 
And the difference between these interpretations does not mean that it's not really social or it's not really um, objective in a way, but that's just what academic discourse is about. Here, of course, um, the philosopher will place um, a Derrida as, as, uh, as an adversary because Foucault is not seen by him as a philosopher. And here, the linguist would say that Saussure is not in the camp of Foucault's because he's not, Foucault is not a linguist. So what we see in these, in these results is, on the one hand, we, we produce new <coughs> meanings or different positions, different associations between people out there we know and the open slots that we come across while reading the utterances. Um, but of course, these slots are filled in different ways. And so we come up with different notions of the relations between these actors in academic discourse. And this is just what academic discourse is about. This is not to read these texts wrong, of course, but um, it's the very practical task of producing a position in academic discourse by my experts. My experts have to read this in a different way, so as to produce some kind of position within academic discourse for themselves. So in a way, when they read these, um, these texts, they never only produce some notion of who is out there and in what relation, but also always how they themselves uh, position themselves in discourse with respect to all these people. And of course, this points to the very fundamental indexical notion, nature of texts. Which, um, which calls into question the notion of coding strategies, where you think that by just coding a certain text by some person, that you would come up with some kind of interpretive intersubjectivity. No, because whenever you try to stabilize meaning, you will always, um, in a way, mobilize your background knowledge. So it is not possible to have that kind of more or less fixed kind of notion of meaning, which is um, just a property of the text, but meaning is always the result of certain readers cooperating with these texts. And we cannot really abstract from this very practical task, uh, which points to the very specific position these readers take in their discourse. This is just a very small observation from my work, and I want to come to the conclusion, because, well, one thing we can say is that every discourse, of course, is subjective. However, as we have seen, this does not mean that behind these texts there is some kind of coherent subject that kind of expresses them se himself or herself. Uh, rather, there are all kinds of different subject positions which are nested in a way, um, which means that the subject in a way is distributed over various positions. And um, in a way, um, the notion of a coherent center speaking behind these texts cannot really um, um, be upheld if you really want to have a close look at how certain readers deal with these texts. Um, the second point is that every discourse, of course, is ambiguous. There is no way to, to reduce this um, multitude of interpretations, which is just the very task um, these specialists have to solve in their discourse. It's not just to understand what is in the text, but always to negotiate with these texts their own positions. And so in a way, um, this is a plea to reflect on the creative practical activity of readers who, who are totally crucial in, in interpretation processes. And we can't just say, well, let's do it in, in a collective workshop and try to come to some more or less objective or intersubjectively controlled meaning, this will always be the product of that workshop. And uh, the same, of course, is true with coding strategies. Any coding team will produce their interpretations with their background knowledge. So in a way, we always need to account for the specific people coming from certain backgrounds if you really want to know what's going on in coding. Um, so to make a long story short, um, what, what I'd like to play for in this little presentation, I hope I didn't take too much time, uh, was, of course, the what, the contents of texts of empirical material. 
are subject to a lot of contestation. Um, many people will see very different things in these text documents or sources. So let's not too much focus on the question of what is in the text, what, what is said in this course, but rather, rather point out that there are certain ways of constructing who says what, who speaks in this course. And for this question, for the various positions that we can construct in this process which is difficult to control by the participants of this course, this we can, we can analyze with rather rigorous means of discourse analysis, which I just tried to give you a very short allusion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Johannes, for this interesting talk. And um, now, just a quick round of questions and answers. Again, no discussion at this point, but only if you have questions with regards to understanding. Any questions? Okay, then, no questions. Oh, yes. About your last paper, if you could just repeat it for one, because I got lost about the who. We have to like reconstruct who is speaking when I'm reading a text. Yeah. Like, yeah. The point is that the way that we construct these positions is we can, it's it's easier to see the linguistic markers in the text, for example, the negations in, in the little example I gave or just the structure of the utterance itself, because an utterance always refers to some person which is, who's the author in a way. Mm -hmm. So there's some very fundamental, even grammatical structures in, these, in, in linguistic material, which we can analyze so as to, to show how this play of positions is negotiated in these presumably monological texts, but in reality, of course, they're extremely dialogical, and that's what we can that's where we have very kind of and a little means to 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 reveal and to discover for the question of what it is that is said in the text, the kind of themes, the semantics, the contents. Here, of course, I mean, at least with that kind of perspective, we are kind of lost. So my 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 plea was in a way to go away from the idea that. Discourse is just subjective, and everybody interprets whatever way, right? But to to analyze the precise rules, structures, and mechanisms, which allow us to have a notion, an idea of who it is that is a subject out there, or me. And this is in this difficult kind of triangle of the author, the other people, and myself as a reader. Any other questions? Okay, so thanks again, Jonas.